Dakota, Sioux, Inuit, uh, many others, and is also Region 4 of the Métis Nation. Every time I offer a land acknowledgement, I, I speak very deeply from the heart when I say that the relationships that we hold with this land and the First Peoples of this land are very crucial in all of the work that we do in our world. And especially for this delightful Pride Month, that in intersectionality between indigeneity and the Pride community is a, is a crucial, crucial piece of the, the social justice web here in our city and in our nation. So thank you to the people who are here, the first people and, and the land on which we sit and gather. My name is Alara Stephanie Cadet, and my pronouns are they, them. I have the pleasure and privilege of being your service leader this morning. This year at UCE, we are joining with other congregations across the continent in exploring the UU Soul Matters themes. Our theme this month is delight, and I am indeed delighted to be with you this morning. This morning is our beloved annual pride service with readings offered up by some of our young adults throughout the morning and our own Reverend Rosemary Morrison is our speaker. For us to be able to be fully present to our time together, I invite you to please turn off any devices that ring, buzz, beep, play 30 seconds of catchy music. Although I confess this morning, I was tempted to make an exception if that catchy music happened to be your favorite pride anthem, but maybe we can just save it till after the service. Our community extends beyond the Sunday morning gathering. We have a monthly newsletter available online and you can join our virtual community on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date on happenings in our extended community. You are welcome here. Whatever you believe or don't believe, whoever you love, however you understand family, whatever your age, ethnicity, or ability, you are welcome here. We extend a special welcome to our visitors and newcomers this morning. Please join us after the service for conversation and coffee where you're welcome to ask us any questions you might have about our community. Now I'll to our lovely Gordon Ritchie for the prelude to help us settle into our bodies and this shared space.
Thanks, Gordon. I'm going to invite Maria Jenkins up to light our chalice. We kindle this flame, remembering that light illuminates the entire rainbow and that every color is a celebration. Jones, you want to come up and give our first reading? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jones, and I go by any pronouns. I'm going to be reading these words by Alok Vaid Manon, who is a public speaker that I absolutely adore. When I'm saying moving beyond the gender binary, what I'm actually insisting is that we are far more tremendous, expansive, celestial than could ever be contained by a body. And that actually, some of the most powerful, awe-inspiring, earth-shattering ways to exist in the world will never be visible. Not because they're not there, but rather because we don't yet have the tools to decipher understand and tabulate them. Thank you. I think I'm just going to stop muting myself. If you want to join me in rising in body or in spirit, we're going to sing hymn number 360, Here We Have Gathered. Sunday service, we take time to acknowledge the many gifts we both bring to and receive from being together here in community. Gifts of talent, volunteer time, and money. Today, we are blessed with the musical talent of Gordon Ritchie, as well as the gifts of volunteer time and service from those who plan, greet, coordinate our sound and video systems, and clean up after. If you wish to make a financial gift, you're welcome to do so as the offering plate passes around in a moment. As a self-governed and financed community, we encourage generosity and acknowledge that there are many ways of being generous. If financial generosity is accessible to you, please know that half of our weekly donations go to local charities that change each month. 
For the month of June, we are supporting the George Spady Society, which describes themselves as recognized as a leader in the development and delivery of effective services for the care, treatment, and support of individuals with substance-related disorders and dual diagnosis. People who come to us find dignity, hope, and healing as they set a new path towards health and well-being. Please pass the offering plate. come up to do your reading. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I, I should have I pulled this up earlier, but you know. Oh yes, I'm Ashton. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I am too close to the microphone. <laughs> Cool, found it. So I am reading something that I wrote called It Gets Better, But It's Great Right Now, or What I Needed to Hear When I Was Growing Into Myself. Before I knew what words to use to describe myself, I didn't even realize I was different. I figured everybody questioned their gender and identity. I didn't even really know transitioning was an option. And as I learned more, it felt like everything started to get worse and more complicated, but it gets better. When I first came out, nobody really believed me. It was a struggle to communicate the feelings that I was just coming to terms to with myself. And my, my family struggled to understand what I could barely even describe. They, they expected me to be an expert while I was kind of just a baby, and the only peers I had lived in different cities or even different countries. But it got better. When many people come out, it's not received well, it's dangerous, it's painful, and there's shame. Some never even come out at all, for various reasons. But I promise you, when you learn to love yourself unconditionally, it gets better. When you're struggling, you hear those words a lot, it gets better. And at your worst, no three words can be more frustrating to hear. You can't deny how true they are, though. While it did get better, it was frustrating to hear. And sometimes what we need to hear is how it's great right now. When you're just discovering who you are, if you've only just given yourself the space to explore, or if you've been loud and proud for years, that's great right now. Every time you meet someone who gets it, whether they're community or ally, being able to feel safe is great right now. If you know someone who's going through this journey, the best way you can be an ally is to offer them your love and support and tell them just how much it's great right now. When you're queer, it's not just about the fight, the hatred, the grief. It's all about your love for oneself and for others, the people you meet, the community, and that's great. That knowing glance when you see someone who, who's just like you or feeling safe when you're just coming out, it's all about the never-ending journey of self-discovery. Who you are is always changing and always growing. 
With, every, with, with everything going on these days, all the news, the laws, and debates, there's one thing I ask you. Remember the love and the community. And remember that you're never alone. We have strength in our community, and that's great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ashton. Yeah, clap. <laughs> Don't be shy. We're going to move into our meditation hymn. Just take a few moments of silence after the hymn before I move into Candles of Joy and Concern and Celebration. But our meditation hymn is 1053, How Could Anyone? And I would invite you to remain seated for this one because then we can enter into a moment of silence after. Thank you for that moment. Our candles of joy and celebration are a cherished tradition in many Unitarian churches all across the world. This morning for Pride, I would invite you as you come up to light your candles, to hold in your heart somebody that you know and love that is a part of our rainbow community. Um, I invite you to come up and light your candles now.
able to get that video working tie in how one of the things that's good now is chosen family for all of the people in community who have had experiences of rejection or ostracization chosen family is one of the pieces that gets us through um, so that's why I picked that song gets us through the hardest times and it's a good thing now so something I really wanted to speak to this morning, and I know Reverend Rosemary is also going to speak to this a little bit, but from a different perspective, is the idea that pride is still political. Um, I know, I know, it's a big statement. But so I'm taking right now, it's, it's in our eighth principle, right? We're about dismantling barriers of systems of oppression in ourselves and in our communities. And right now I'm taking an indigenous resistance class for my degree. And one of the biggest pieces about dismantling systems of oppression is our daily acts of resistance against oppression. And that's political, whether we like it or not. Our daily acts against oppression are political acts. and. For me, one of the things that really struck me in the last few weeks as I've been working on a paper for this course is how every time I correctly gender people, so I use people's correct pronouns, including my own, and every time I correct somebody on mine, I'm resisting oppressive systems. 
And I feel like that's really important for us to realize that it's, a, it's not personal and it's a bigger, there's a bigger picture at play when it comes to dismantling systems of oppression. Some of the simplest acts can be the most powerful. Because when I, so I have considered myself non-binary and identified as non-binary for about six or seven years now. And my friend Heather Smith from Westwood, who some of you I'm sure know, lots of you know, um, asked me for years, when are you gonna change your pronouns? And I went, I don't know, like I'm non-binary, but it sounds really hard to change my pronouns. I have to correct people. I'm, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be hard and painful. And, and that's still true. But one of the things that I realized in having multiple conversations with Heather and in being a part of young adult community within the CUC, which is where I started encountering neo-pronouns, um, is that if I wasn't changing my pronouns, I was doing an injustice to the generation to come. So in changing my pronouns to they, them, and in correcting people, it's, it's an act against oppressive systems, but what it's doing is creating a world that's safe for our young people to grow up in. And I really, I just really wanted to lift that up because I think it's really easy to get entangled in, in identity politics, right? But it's about creating a safe world. And that's like, I felt dishonest not changing my pronouns and I felt like if I hadn't, I would be a part of that oppressive system because I'm just like, it's because it keeps me safe not to have to correct people all the time. Um, and that's not fair because that doesn't create a better world for our young people. So that was my reflection for this month and just uplifting the idea that every time we get it right, we're making a better world for everybody. Thank you. And now, we're gonna sing number 131, Love Will Guide Us, because that's what it's all about, folks. Can I talk now? <laughs> I don't know, maybe. That was a lot. <laughs> I don't know, can you, right? <laughs> I think this is the first time I, it's been, um, but what a privilege it is to have so many talented service leaders in this congregation that I, and, and I, get, I got to let go of control of the service which was really scary and wonderful, absolutely wonderful. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation and my pronouns are she and her. And I did have a couple of things I wanted to say before I started my message. I'm going to General Assembly 
I'll be leaving tonight and I'll be um, part of the UUMA, Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association. We will get together until Wednesday. I'm really looking forward to that. There'll be about 500 UU ministers gathering in Pittsburgh and then the general UU people will be joining us after that and I'm very much looking forward to it. I'll, I'm hoping to learn a lot, especially about the uh, Commission on Appraisal, the Article 2 Commission, and the EUUA is looking at um, going from a set of principles to a set of values. And I'll be speaking about that more in the new church year. This is the last Sunday that I will be with you until September. So while you are away, I invite you to bring or gather water from different bodies of water that you may have visited over the summer or even from your tap if you stayed home or the North Saskatchewan River. And we'll enjoy a beautiful flower, flower water communion homecoming celebration in September. A, a lot has happened this year. You called a new minister. We ratified some a mission statement, a vision statement, how we're going to live into those. We, we created a covenant together, a covenant of right relations that we will try ed, to live into. And it is always a try and error and one step back and two steps forward. And the work and the joy of it is when we do come out of covenant and we learn to go back, come back into covenant with one another. Most of the services this summer will be on Zoom, so there'll be Zoom parties here in the sanctuary and then, or you can enjoy them from home on Sunday or any other time. That doesn't stop people from organizing themselves and doing stuff together. You can, you can do that. Including yeah. the Friday movie nights over and the summer. Including Friday movie night. Is that happening? Yeah. Yes. So that'll be in the newsletter, watch for it. Friday evening movie nights here, movie and discussion on the big screen. Okay, I think that was all. I didn't get to, I didn't get to, we forgot the announcements. That's, those were my announcements. <laughs> oh well. As Alara said, the Soul Matters theme this month is delight, and last month it was creativity. And I see creativity and delight being closely and magically intertwined. We are creative beings, delightfully so. And I'm not sure we can separate them, that taking the delight out of the process of creativity is possible, or when we are or find something delightful, creativity has probably played some kind of part in that. And today, a lot going on. Today's Father's Day, too. And for me, this day has always been complicated. I did not have a good relationship with my dad. I remember when he was alive and I would be picking out a card for him you know, going to the grocery store, drug store, and going through all the cards and reading all the messages carefully, I would silently weep at the words that some people were able to say to their fathers. Wow, a person might actually pick up a card that burned in my hand and buy it because it matched the sentiment in their heart. I know that many folks here have had or are wonderful fathers, or fathers-in-law, or stepfathers, or foster fathers, or fathers of choice, or, and we've all had some positive male role models in our life. I certainly have. I've had and had lots of very fine uncles, a grandfather, and a couple of excellent fathers-in-law. Not long before my parents married, my father had recently returned from the European front in World War II. He was the wireless operator of the 8th Reconnaissance Regiment out of Swift Current, Saskatchewan. He found himself in a situation he was too sensitive for and never recovered. Society at that time said, you are a man. 
men are supposed to act in a certain way. And by the way, all that bad stuff you saw in Europe, just forget about it and don't talk about it either. And it didn't go well. And I know my story is not unique and is very unique. We all have stories about the person who took part in our creation and some of us have stories about how we were parented or our parenting. It seems like the possibilities are so more open now for everyone to take part in child rearing. It used to be the person that gave birth to the child that did all the work. Now that dichotomy is changing. When my oldest grandson was born, it was very important to my daughter and my son-in-law that he take part in the caring for my grandson, Teo. There were so many times that I wanted to say, please, just give that baby to his mother. <laughs> or I wanted to strongly say, you are not doing this right. <laughs> I was so socialized into thinking this way that it was incredibly uncomfortable for me to watch without screwing up my face, keeping my hands still and my mouth, this was especially hard if you know me at all, keeping my mouth shut. I was under strict orders by my daughter to allow Ghislain, my son-in-law, the time and opportunity to learn how to be a caregiver too. Something magically delightful and creative happened. Now, Teo, my grandson, is just as likely to call out in the middle of the night, Papa, as well as Mama. Etienne, his little brother, is learning that both his parents are nurturing, caring, and competent. I don't have to sit on my hands when Ghislaine has the baby, and it's a beautiful thing. Baby boomers like me and older, and I'm at the tail end of the baby boomer era, were taught very clearly that there are dichotomies by which we must conform to or be shunned by society, and probably even folks younger than me. Men earned the money, women looked after the home and had the babies. Any deviation from this threatened societal norms that were placed there to keep the power structures in place. Men at the top, mostly white men at the top, women, children, and of course, the men and women must be clearly defined men and women and be attracted to one another. Women must especially conform to their gender norm and make sure they were as pleasing as possible to the male gaze. This way of thinking is not very old and in fact is gaining popularity again as we speak. In Indiana, they just passed a law that if you wish to use a female washroom, a, woman that, a washroom that says woman on it, that you have to prove that your chromosomes are going to let you in there. I was horrified to hear this. This weird push to the right is trying to get us back to where we left our delightful imaginings of who we are and who we might become. I, for one, am finding it very scary. Right now, there are Unitarian Universalist ministers that have been settled in states where their personhood is not only not wanted, but is illegal. It's been outlawed. Ministers that I hold dear. As those on the margins push and dance their way into the center of society saying, we are valid. We wish to take part in all that society has to offer. Some in society say, no, no. We are not willing to allow you to mess with my image of who I am. No, no, not with all your flamboyance and lack of womenly wiles. 
When I was doing my social work degree many moons ago, one catchphrase was, the personal is political, meaning if someone had a personal problem like inadequate access to resources, intimate partner violence, addiction, mental health concerns, we needed to kind of look up the ladder. What are the policies in place that keep the resources so unevenly distributed? Where are the wraparound and low barrier mental health and addictions, dual diagnosis services that help people manage themselves in a healthy way? The personal is political. If you somewhat see someone with a personal problem, there is a political policy in place. In seminary, it changed to Yes, the personal is political, but it is also pastoral. There's one more step to that, or from your side. <laughs> we need to find, there, yes, we need to house and respect the body. Yes, we need to have available mental health services. And also, yes, we need to attend to the more ethereal and invisible aspects of human beings. We are spiritual beings, not just mind and body. In other words, we are more than the sum total of our parts. We all have an essence, a spirit, if you will. Use whichever word you are comfortable with. It is our essence, our spirit, that is being crushed when society tells us we need to be a certain way adhere to norms and mores that don't fit for us, or tell us that we are an abomination if we are a particular way. Have I talked to you very much about my friend Lisa? Lisa Salazar? No? A little? A little. <laughs> so forgive me if I repeat myself. So she's written a couple of books about her experience growing up. She grew up in a strict Colombian household. And she was about probably 10 years old when, uh, pardon me, Lisa is probably about 10 years older than I am and began transitioning later in life. And she has given me permission to talk, say her story, and she's published her story. So, um, but her and I have talked about the fact that most Pride Sundays or Trans Day of Remembrance or Out Day, I speak. I talk about her. She remembers as a young child in Colombia knowing she was different. She so wished she could be like her brother who was so sure of himself. But she wasn't, and she kept everything to herself. In her 50s, she came out to a friend, and that friend supported her and loved her into being. She speaks of her fear based on safety and rejection. That fear is real, as society was very clear with her that as Jim, she had male privilege, and her being Lisa threatened male privilege. It also mirrored for them that everything isn't black or white, that there is a mix of feminine and masculine within each of us, along with every other binary and dichotomy that is unimaginable. We are not this way or that. We, are, we don't think this way or that. Lisa has three grown sons and has a complicated relationship with these days, with days like today with them, and that ask us to think about our fathers in a particular way. Her sons introduce her to their friends as, this is my dad, Lisa. Days like today are important, though, because they ask us to think about our relationships with our families. It also asks us to think about how we want to be thought of by our friends and our family. And I think even more importantly, these markers on the calendar ask us to think about who we are and how we want to be in the world. We are restricted only by our own imaginings 
by the limits we arbitrarily place upon our beings, by the limits we allow society to place upon us and upon those that we love. Today is Pride Sunday, and it is important to remember that Pride began as a willful, law-breaking act that began to change that began the change of our collective understandings. Part of Lisa's project for her master's degree at Vancouver School of Theology was to talk to many people, survey even more, and then analyze the data she accumulated. Her research showed that trans people scored higher on the how spiritually aware are you continuum, or how spiritual of a being are you. It makes sense, though, if you think about it. Not everyone who does deep spiritual work will find out that they are trans or non-binary. But a person that is trans or non-binary has had to do deep spiritual work to discover who they truly are. Spiritual and personal growth are the same, remember? Finding out who we are, what makes us tick, why we feel a particular way, why we respond or react in a particular way, how we view ourselves. That kind of personal investigation is what makes us healthy and mature. In doing that work, we might find something delightful. We had lost the thread of decades or years or months ago. We might find out that we have wounds that haven't healed over and are impacting our relationships in a negative way. We might find out that we aren't actually being as authentic as we wish we were. And we might find out that we need a course correction in our lives. And unfortunately, sad to say, there is no there there. Though this road of self-discovery ends, doesn't end. On this Pride Sunday, let's remember that the personal is political, is pastoral, that all are worthy of love and belonging, that fear is running amok in society right now, and we as Unitarian Universalists must be willing to resist that fear in ourselves first and foremost and then move it into the wider community. I'm going to say that again. We must resist that fear in ourselves first, and then move it out into the wider community. First, we as individuals, individuals and then collectively, must dig deep, find out what makes us tick, examine our patterns and responses, analyze and heal ourselves enough so that we can go out into the wider community with clarity and good intention and positive impact. That part's really important. First, we must go deep before we can go wide. Otherwise, the impact might not be what we want it to be. I was lucky enough once to foster an amazing youth named Raven. Raven was creative, delightful, very challenging. She loved to sing, dance, draw, and she loved everything sparkly. She was a teen on the outside and a toddler on the inside, so I had to observe her to figure out what she couldn't really tell me. She came to me from a home that was that everybody in that home dressed in blue jeans and overalls and t-shirts and sneakers. And so that's what she brought with her. I took her to a store and uh, quickly discovered that jeans and t-shirts were not what she would like to wear. And she started looking and ooing and aahing over anything pretty and pink and sparkly and her wardrobe slowly changed, and she moved into being who she was. It was really lovely to see her transform as she got to wear the clothes that reflected who she was inside. 
We all need that chance to figure out who we are. And sometimes we need help in figuring it out, like Raven did. Not everyone is trans or non-binary or gay or all of the things. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that we are much more complex and creative and delightful than we allow ourselves to be. Society has made sure through the institutions that we have all been a part of that our choices were limited, that we had to pick this or that, be this way or that way. And heaven forbid, if you decide to be creative just for creative sake and not produce something excellent. And perhaps you were one of the lucky few who got to where you are today fully understanding, accepting, and appreciating every aspect of yourself. Any hands? Awesome. I think I'm getting there, but it took a lot of work. I certainly was and bef wasn't before I start being intentional about this work. So if everyone in society understood, accepted, and appreciated themselves fully, would they be fussed about what someone else wore? Or who someone else loved? Or what they created within themselves and in the larger world? I think not. First, we go deep. Then, we go wide. On this Father's Day, Pride Sunday, may you have the courage to shine a light into the corner of your own being and bring those beautiful, delightful, creative aspects of yourself into full light, into the center. And as we do that individually, we, may we begin to notice here at UCE those on the margins and begin to bring those voices and experiences and those, that beauty away from the margins and into the center of our awareness. And may we learn to love. And in doing so, bring delight to us all. And so may it be. Amen. Thank you, Rosemary, Reverend Rosemary. We're going to sing, get our energy up. Let's get some light. Let's get some lights up in here. <laughs> Gordon said, let there be light. Uh, we're going to sing the number 1028, Fire of Commitment. Thank you.
going to invite Red up to do our closing read. Hello, I'm Renhard Tessier, he, him, and I'm reading, I cannot prove to you that I, or we, are human, <coughs> by Julian Jamaica Ninan Soto from Spilling the Light. I cannot prove to you that I'm a person, but you can hold my hand, cool and dry, while we pray or just breathe, ragged breaths catching on our aching ribs. I cannot prove to you that brown skin is holy, that black skin is sacred, but you can know it, luminous and irrepressible, the tabernacle of your own liberation. I cannot even prove to you that every queer body, every trans and envy body, every ace and bisexual body sings back to the universe its immense generative power of yes. I cannot prove to you with quadratic certainty that what a disabled body holds is a story of wisdom beyond perfection, like a red sun emerging from beyond a cloud of dust. So the answers that I have for a country hacking up a death rattle and a democracy with a wheezing, waxy pallor are about courage to love. Our desperation, not only for survival, but also to tread above the worst of our collective nature and to get each other free, unashamed that there came a day when we were willing to risk looking foolish, to simply stay together and alive. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Now I'm going to invite Reverend Rosemary up for a special acknowledgement. Oksana? Oh. So a thing happened. <laughs> Yesterday I walked over to the, the flower shop near my home and I bought Oksana this absolutely gorgeous bo uh, bouquet of flowers. And I put it on my deck because it was nice and cool out there. And it's still there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that. It's like, don't forget the flowers, don't forget the flowers. I forgot the flowers, but I'm going to get them to you this afternoon. But you folks don't get to see how, what a gorgeous bouquet of flowers I bought for Oksana, which is a mere token of the, uh, the beauty and the love and the creativity and the wonder that you brought to this congregation in your year and a half with us. I'm so grateful to you. It's been a privilege working with you, and I'm going to miss you. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> well, this morning, uh, Alara spoke so, so well about different ways of moving forward and then Reverend Rosemary reflected that by saying sometimes we need to move back in order to move forwards and I think I came to a point where I realized maybe I just need, need to move sideways in order for us to move forwards <laughs> and so I think just stepping out of the position gives our church an opportunity to reflect on the position and the direction that we're headed in and I hope that um, as much as I've gleaned from so many different connections, large and small in the church, I hope I've been able to provide a, a little bit uh, to the foundation that already exists so that we have a smooth way forward for spiritual exploration. Thank you, everybody. And we look forward to having you continue being with us in our, in our congregation. Thank you. Unmuted, there we go. Just took a second to kick in. I'm gonna invite Maria back up for our chalice extinguishing. We extinguish this flame, but keep the fire burning in our hearts that moves us ever closer to love, and justice and liberation for every color of the rainbow. Blessed be and amen. Let's carry the flame. <laughs> <laughs>